Greg Avellino, if you do not know that already. As I scan the crowd, I see we have new people coming to the college planning uh, process, and I see we also have experienced people. And then you have people like me that just purchased my first new suit in five years because we're going to college tuition. <laughs> Three kids. <laughs> so it, it, is, it, it is an exciting time. Uh, it can be a very daunting time. It can be a very stressful time. I will tell you just the one piece of advice that we always follow. We chose one night a week, usually that was on a Sunday night, where we all sat down and we talked about what was the next steps in the college planning process. Um, and it just helped to lessen the stress for the family, and it helped us to be able to know that we had time to focus on that each week. But without further ado, we have a lot of information coming to you tonight. Just listen carefully. Uh, when we get done tonight, we're gonna post this, it's being videotaped. Uh, as well as the PowerPoint we will also put up on the uh, website, as well as put it on Parents Square too as well. So if you miss something tonight, we'll have an opportunity to go back and either listen to it or be able to see it. So welcome, and uh, we have an amazing bunch of counselors here this evening that will be presenting, as well as our guests, and I will not reveal that until Mrs. West is going to turn over to Joe West. Thanks, Mr. Avellino. Welcome, everyone. We are very excited to be able to offer this um, evening in person. Um, tonight, you're going to hear a lot of information. Um, the presentation is really um, divided into two parts. The first part will be all of our school counselors, and they are going to talk about the college application process, everything from SATs to transcripts to college es essays and more. And then the second part of the presentation will be a guest presenter, um, the Director of Financial Aid at Lemoyne College, Mr. Maximo Flint Morgan. And then we'll have an opportunity at the very end to um, answer any questions that you might have. I'd like to introduce the counseling team first. Uh, we have Ms. Michelle Moisick, Ms. Jordan Campo, Mrs. Jackie Riley, Mr. Michael White, and Mr. Christopher Robinson. And I'm going to turn it right over to Mr. White to talk about SCORE. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are very well aware that we are about to share a lot of information. Um, we assure you we are putting it up in a lot of places on our website. We are going to go over it individually with your student. Um, and so there are going to be a lot of opportunities, including checklists that um, come along with those meetings with your student, so they will come home with step-by-step -step things that they need to do. One of the big pieces of that is we are introducing a new program this year, or a new vehicle in this process, which is called SCORE. Uh, for those of you that are familiar or, or have older students, we used to use a program called Naviance. It's a place that you can research colleges, you can keep track of your college application materials, uh, request letters of recommendation. Counselors can send materials online. We are switching to SCORE. Um, we find it has a much easier interface. It actually is going to create way less paperwork for your student. Um, you as a parent, we will be, once we kind of roll it out to students in senior meetings, we will be rolling it out to parents as well, so you will have access to some of that information. Um, so we're really excited about it. We're going to go over it with your student in the meetings and so they will become familiar and it's really quite user friendly. And I'm going to give you a bit of a, a tour of the program now. So what you see in front of you is, is what your students are going to see within this program. Um, it has some really cool features, things that you'll be able to see along the way. So as we go kind of across these tabs, the Discover tab is where you can begin researching colleges. So our students right now may not have their list of schools set, and that's okay. Um, this is a place that they can start digging and finding schools that maybe are similar to ones they like. If you go in, you're able to select certain schools. Many of them have virtual tours that you can jump right into the campus. Below there's general overview information. You can review academics to see what sort of major could you choose at that school. There's admissions information, GPAs they're looking for, SAT or ACT. As you scroll down, it'll even tell you, does the school require the SAT or ACT as a part of their application? All the information 
at your students' fingertips. The nice part are there are also these graphs that exist that show past ESM students. Uh, our data goes all the way back to 2010, and whether they were accepted or denied, and your student will be able to click right on it and see uh, a specific student, what was their GPA, what was their SAT score, did they get accepted to that institution or not? And it gives them a sense of, is this school kind of far reaching for me? Oh, am I middle of what they are looking for? Um, and so on. So it's a great tool to use in the research process. Beyond that, it's a way to keep track of college applications. In here, they have different categories, and we talked about really easy, easy user interfaces. It's a matter of sliding schools along. So under suggested, you as a parent can suggest the school to your student. We as counselors often get asked, I like X school. Do you know of any schools that are similar? Well, we can pop them in under this suggested column for them to look at. They can shift it over into following if it's a school that they think is kind of interesting. Eventually, shift it over to applying because I intend to apply to this school, I'm in the middle of it. And once they shift it over to applied, this is where it gets really helpful for your student is that we as counselors get alerted. It tells us, hey, the student has applied to the school and now it's time for us to do our part, which you're gonna hear a little bit more this evening. It's also a spot where they can request letters of recommendations from teachers, which you will hear more about, but it's as simple as request a recommendation, they type the teacher name in, and that starts the process for that too. Under the My Profile, it's a place for students to keep information. They can put information in about activities, things they've been involved in. We as counselors have access and so do the teachers. So as we write letters of recommendation, it's conveniently in a spot that we can get that information to write our letters as well. Last but not least, there are two pieces in here that um, are kind of are going to play a bit of a role for your students so first and foremost is under events and deadlines colleges as well as the military they're coming to visit our students regularly so as i scroll down this list you are going to see schools have already scheduled times in the military to come in and visit and so if your student is following one of these schools in score they'll actually be alerted that hey SUNY Canton is going to be here on this date. Make sure that you check in with them as well. Under all college sec sessions, um, you can even come in here and see, so this fake student we had, we had them following different schools, but it highlights events that are happening at those schools. So sometimes they have virtual chats or information sessions or a financial aid session all of those are posted here where you can access it on their website right at your fingertips uh, to get information for each school. So that's the brief interview of school or the uh, introduction to SCORE. While it is new, we really think it's going to be an easy transition for us. In the meantime, we have Naviance until December. So if anyone's sitting in the audience thinking, my student's been using Naviance to research their schools, have they lost that? They have it. So while we work through our senior meetings, they can still use the Naviance stuff and we will help them pull that information into SCORE. Next, uh, Ms. Campo is going to speak about the rest of the process. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to go over the college application process just in a nutshell, so talking about what are the important dates for you and your students to keep in mind, um, milestones throughout the process, um, and just kind of things that your students should know as they establish their own personal application timelines. Um, so that said, it's really important to note this is a really general overview. This process is going to look different for every student. It varies a lot depending on that student's interests and their goals, um, how many college options are they even considering to start out with. Um, so when we meet with your students in senior meetings that are going to be starting soon and over the course of the next month, um, counselors will be establishing more of a defined and detailed and tailored plan based on what that student is planning to do um, and where they're planning on applying. 
Um, so the first really important date to keep in mind is October 1st. That is when FAFSA becomes available online, um, and that's the online financial aid application everyone has to fill out for that student to be eligible for any form of financial aid. I'm not gonna talk more about FAFSA, you're gonna get a lot about that in a little bit, but October 1st just is a really important date to keep in mind. Um, bringing it to November, this is when deadlines for college applications are going to start for students that wanna apply early. Um, so early deadlines are kind of a special option for students that want to apply sooner rather than later to one or more colleges that are that are absolute top choices. Um, early action is a non-binding deadline. That is for students who are looking for um, just an admissions decision from a top choice school sooner rather than later. Um, students can apply to more than one school <laughs> early action. It is non-binding. Um, early decision, similarly, is an early deadline for students to apply to their top choice, but that is binding. So if a student applies to their top choice school early decision, um, they are committing to going to that school if they get accepted financial aid package site unseen. Um, so students can only apply to one college early decision. Um, whether or not schools have early deadlines, whether it's action or decision, and when those deadlines are varies by college. It's not a universal process for all schools. Um, but those deadlines are often as early as November 1st or 15th. So if applying early is something your student's interested in, those come up really quickly and definitely require them to be getting to work pretty quickly. Um, other than early deadlines, like November and beyond is when regular decision deadlines come around and that's the school's primary deadline that most students are gonna be applying for. Um, that, again, varies very widely school by school. Um, they can happen anywhere starting between December and early spring, and some of them even happen when we are on holiday break. Um, generally, we recommend students try to finish their applications before Thanksgiving, kind of regardless of what deadlines they're working towards. There's two reasons for that. First of all, that gives our office and your students a lot of time to make sure their applications are set and they've submitted all of the materials well before the actual deadline. Um, and second, it takes a really big and often stressful task off everyone's plate ahead of the holiday season, and I think most kids will be relieved to be able to enjoy that time off and not have to like talk with their extended family about applications. So. Um, Next. So moving forward, um, what we ask um, is for students to give their counselors 10 school days notice prior to the deadline of that college application to process supporting documentation. And that documentation being sending their transcripts, sending their uh, teacher letter recommendations, or if there's any other relevant documentation. Um, so what Mr. White just showed you guys on SCORE, that process of moving the colleges over and getting it into the applied category so that way we get alerted. That all needs to happen 10 days before the deadline. Um, and then we'll communicate with students from there if we need more information or how that process is going. Um, so what that means is, for example, like if you have a January 1st deadline for an application, which those schools are out there, um, that request really needs to be made to us by December 9th, given the holiday break to make sure things are done in, on time. Um, so for that reason, students really need to be doing a lot of research, being very specific about what deadlines they're applying towards, and then kind of reverse engineering from there of when they need to be done with their applications. Um, following the submission of an application, it is super critical that your students are checking the email that they use for their applications regularly. Um, communication will be coming in from colleges. It could be an admissions decision that your student's gonna wanna know about right away. It also could be a college's request for more information or missing documentation, and they will also need to make sure they see that and act on that right away. So checking email regularly is super important. Um, throughout this fall and spring, hopefully your students have already had the opportunity to tour some schools that they're really interested in, um, but that process continue all through senior year, either going to campus tours or um, attending like the admissions rep visits here that Mr. White showed you guys on SCORE, virtual information events, and then Accepted student stakes come up in the spring, and that's usually um, maybe a student attending one or two, maybe more of schools that they are deciding between before they make their final choice. Um, throughout the process, we ask that students keep us aware of admissions decisions as they come in and share actually like the awards letter or the decision letter with us, so that way we can keep track of what's going on with your student. Um, it's also really helpful just for data keeping for our office as well. Um, and obviously tell us when your student has made a final choice of where they're going, so that way we know where a final transcript needs to be sent after graduation. 
Um, and then the last really important deadline is May 1st. That is the national decision and deposit deadline for most colleges, not all, but definitely most four-year colleges. So that is the date that students need to have their final cho choice made and submit a deposit to secure their spot at that university. And once that's done, more information from the college will come regarding like signing up for housing, signing up for classes, summer orientation, and things like that. Um, and that is kind of like the last real big milestone in the process for most students. So again, this is really general overview in a nutshell of some important beats that come over the course of the year. Um, very different by student, and of course, anytime there's questions about um, how things vary from college to college, contacting the admissions rep and contacting us for questions is always welcome. All right, and I think I'm giving it to Mrs. Riley next. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm gonna first start talking about the different types of applications that your students are gonna encounter through this process. There are really three different ways that students can apply to their schools. The first is through an application developed by the colleges themselves, usually found right on their website. Um, a good example of that is OCC. The only way that you can apply to OCC is using their application on their website. Um, in senior meetings, we're gonna be working with students on which application types can be best for them. So we can actually show them where that application is on uh, the college's website if that's what they choose to use. If you're applying just to OCC, that's the only application you're going to have to deal with during this process. One of the other types is a SUNY application. All four-year SUNY schools participate in one application that allows students who are applying to several SUNY schools to use one application to do so. But all SUNY schools also participate in the Common App. The Common App is a large consortium of, it's over a thousand schools now, um, that allows students to apply to most, if not all, of their four-year colleges using one account. A lot of students are gonna use that option, and that is uh, part of the senior meeting. If your students are looking at that as an option, we actually start that account opening process with your students. In junior meetings in the spring, we strongly advised your students, juniors and seniors now, to come to their senior meeting knowing which schools they were going to apply to. And part of the reason for that was so that in their senior meeting, we can help them determine which application type is gonna be best for them. Um, so hopefully when they're gonna be pulled from classes to come to their meetings with us, they'll have a good sense of what that list is so we can start that process with them right in that meeting. Um, the next piece that I'm gonna talk about is part of the application that the school is responsible for sending to colleges on students' behalf, um, and that's the letters of recommendation. Most four-year colleges either require letters of recommendation or they really like to see them. Most two-year schools do not need this. Uh, generally, there are three types of letters, the teacher letter, the counselor letter, and an outside provider. Each school you'll probably find requires or really likes to see a different combination of these. And it is up to the students to know what their colleges are gonna require of them. The teacher letter. Colleges know that teachers are with your kids day in and day out. Um, they can speak to their academic ability as well as their relationship with adults in the building and peers. Um, so these letters are really important. In junior meetings, we invited all students to think about two teachers, at least, that they would like to ask to write them letters of recommendation. Um, these are generally gonna be folks who kids have a really good relationship with, relatively current teachers, so junior year is usually a sweet spot for that. Um, and content area is also really important too. So for example, if you're gonna major in music, you're probably gonna wanna ask for a letter from the band director to the choir director, because that's gonna make a lot of sense. We also invited students to ask teachers before they went away for the summer to start writing those letters. That's a courtesy to help the teachers uh, 
do some of the writing over the summer because in the fall it's actually a lot of them are writing a lot of letters and these take a lot of time. Um, it also took that piece off of kids' plates. If that didn't happen, that's okay. But now is definitely the time to start that process. And we always ask students to have an in-person conversation with their teacher because it's, again, a, a professional practice and the presentation of that request is important because we tell kids, you're asking for a favor. So it's important that they do that soon so that teachers have the appropriate time to write. Um, in senior meetings, we will show students how to submit an electronic request and score so that teachers have a place to upload those letters. But once students have requested their letters, they're done. Teachers write, upload, and we send. So students' role in that is done at that point. The counselor letter functions similarly to the teacher letter, but some colleges are very particular about we require a counselor letter, we require a teacher letter. So again, it's important that students know what their colleges need. We also need to know that students need a letter from us. Um, that's not something we automatically write for all students, so it is important that they let us know. And the way that they let us know that they need one is by filling out our autobiographical survey which right now is posted to our website, and we will show students where that's located in their senior meetings. The more information they put in that survey, the better letter we can craft for your students. Um, they're giving us permission to share information with admissions reps, um, and so the more they put in, the better letter we can create for them. And the outside provider letter, that's for students who might have a really good relationship with a coach outside of school, or maybe an employer. They don't have score accounts because they're not part of the ESM family. So what we'll tell students to do is let those providers have our counselors' email addresses and have their outside provider email us directly, and then we can take the letter from there and submit it to schools. And that brings me to the counselor role in the letter recommendation process. We tell students that we are the gatekeepers. Um, students aren't going to see the letters that are written on their behalf, but we will. We read every single letter that goes out of here, and we only send letters that are going to enhance the student's profile. Um, once in a while, when we get a letter from a teacher who's writing 50, you might find a typo. And that's why it's important for us to review that. But this goes in line with why you heard Ms. Campo say a minute ago that we need a 10 school day turnaround to process applications because sometimes we'll get a letter that might be missing some punctuation or it might have a typo somewhere. We have to read it, send it back to the provider. They have to rewrite, re-upload. We have to, re this can take up to 10 school days. So that's why it's critical that kids are aware of their deadlines so that we can get the materials to the schools on time. Um, and I've said this before, but it is worthy of repeating it. Make sure, students, that you know what types of letters are required by each school. You'll see everything from a school that will only read one letter up to five letters. So just be mindful of what is required of you and communicate that to your counselors so they can help you uh, through the application process accurately and on time. I think now I'm turning it over to Mr. Robinson to talk about the transcripts. Good evening, everyone. So when we talk about the college application, we're talking about multiple components to that. And as Ms. Riley mentioned, Letters of recommendation are just one of those components. So I'm gonna talk about the transcript, which is the most important piece of that application. And that's because it's a snapshot of what your student has done throughout their high school career. On the transcript, college admissions folks will be able to see all of the classes that he or she has taken throughout their high school career, the grades they've achieved, of course, in those classes, Regents exam scores, and GPA and rank as well. <laughs> Something to keep in mind is that when we send out transcripts, which happens halfway through senior year, 
college admissions folks are going to see the classes that students take during their senior year. They're also going to see the grades that they've achieved so far. So when we speak to students individually in senior meetings, we stress tremendously that we want students to keep their foot on the accelerator during senior year for that reason. So senior year is, is important and we want folks to know that. The college essay is, is quite different in that it's another part or another component of the application, but this one, unlike the transcript, which I like to think of as kind of the data piece or the data side of things, the college transcript is more uh, a tool where students can tell their story, they can choose to decide what they want to write about. The common application that Mrs. Riley spoke about provides five options for the college essay. Students will then be able to choose one of those options and describe, for example, something that's unique to them, maybe something they've overcome in the past, or something they've accomplished. So the college essay is different in that it provides something for college admissions folks to see that the transcript cannot or really any other component of the application. And we've listed some tips, including writing one essay that goes to all colleges, valuing your story, what's unique about you, getting into detail about one or two things in your life rather than going over your entire life story is really important. Just as important as utilizing a trusted adult a parent, family member, teacher, staff member, counselor, someone who can help proofread that because college admissions folks don't want to see uh, essays full of grammatical and spelling errors. So please, please, please proofread um, those essays. It's real important. I'm going to turn it over now to Ms. Moisson to talk about one of the other components of the college application and that's standardized testing. everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the SAT and the ACT. So those are two standardized tests our students could take and that they may send their scores on with their college applications. So students, if you are still interested in taking one of these tests, um, you can register at the collegeboard.org or act.org. And I just want to mention that SUNY campuses have temporarily suspended the SAT and ACT testing requirement for students applying for admission to a SUNY bachelor's degree granting campus for the 23-24 academic year. If you're a student who already took the SAT and ACT and want to submit your scores, you can do so and SUNY will look at them as part of their holistic review. If you are applying to a private school, you will need to go to the college's website to determine whether or not the SAT or ACT is required or waived for this year's application. You can also go on to SCORE as well to see that. And if you're a student with a disability, such as a 504 IEP, please speak with your school counselor regarding testing accommodations. So this slide covers a topic that will only apply to a small group of students. First, we have the NCAA, which is college athletics. So for student athletes who are anticipating being Division I or Division II athletes, they must register with the NCAA for certification ahead of time. There is a cost to register, which is $90, but there is a fee waiver um, if needed. So um, once a student registers, registers, they need to contact their school counselor so the counselor can send the high school transcript. Beyond that, we don't really have um, much more of a role for NCAA purposes. The first point of contact for students when it comes to the NCAA is their high school coach or a club team coach as well as um, our high school athletic department and the college's athletic department that is recruiting the athlete. We are going to have a large group of student athletes who will play Division III junior college or undecided, and that's okay. There are no requirements for those students with the NCAA, but there is an option to create a free profile page. So similarly, when it comes to special talents, there is also an additional step in the college application process. So special talents are areas where students may be applying to a major that falls traditionally within the arts. 
So majors could be in music, art, graphic design, film, architecture, fashion, performing arts, etc. So certainly not all of the majors are listed there, but they will often require an audition or a portfolio in addition to a traditional college application. Again, double check with the college or university to see if an audition or a portfolio is required. And now I will turn over to Mr. White for scholarships. So at the start of this, uh, Mrs. West had mentioned that there's really two parts to this, and I think that's a really important way to look at it. The pieces we just talked about are the college application side of things. There is that piece, and we will have checklists, whether you, we have a two-year college checklist as well as a four-year college checklist that will walk your student through everything they need to do. But separately, there is also the financial aid process. Um, I'm not going to dive into the financial aid piece because that's what's going to be discussed next, but it is common that we get questions about free money, scholarships, where can my student find them, uh, how do we start getting free money. And so um, we, we posted these that are up here. It's important to know a, a lot of scholarships that are out there are based on merit. So the school themselves will give it to your students simply because they meet the GPA or SAT score or whatever their standard is, that there's no level of application that's automatic, if you will, okay? Many schools for freshmen, that is the scholarship that's available. There's no real additional ones to apply for. But there are schools out there, if you get on their financial aid website, they may have some additional scholarships that exist that your student as an incoming freshman can apply for. And so it's worth looking at the website but no, not all of them will have that for incoming freshmen. Um, in addition, there are outside scholarships, all sorts of businesses, maybe your place of work, a church, your bank, credit union. Um, look for those. There are websites that exist, and we have them kind of posted here, FastWeb, uh, RaiseMe is something that we've kind of had in our newsletter since your student was a freshman. Um, our website, we have resources there as well. We also get kind of old school flyers and emails from corporations, different places, that we will try to get into your students' hands if we know they meet the specific criteria, but some of them are really general in nature. We post them, um, this year we're working on, uh, we're shifting kind of to a Google document that will be live, that we're gonna get out on our website into SCORE, we're gonna have it in a lot of different places so students can find that information as well. There are ESM district scholarships. An application will go out in March. We make sure that every senior has an application in their hands. If they complete it, they become eligible for some scholarships that exist in the ESM community. Um, and those are given out in the June awards night that we have here in the auditorium. And then last but not least, what I mentioned is really make sure, check your place of employment, your credit union or bank, other local places as well. Um, so that's a good transition uh, to discuss the financial aid piece in depth. We are lucky to have the director of financial aid from Lemoyne College, uh, Max, uh, Maximo Flint Morgan. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Let me uh, Oh, look at that, all right, off we go. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Maximo Flint Morgan. I'm the Director of Financial Aid at Lemoyne College. Uh, welcome to my set of slides. Uh, if you want to stand up now, that's probably a good idea just to get your juices flowing a little bit. There's a lot more information coming your way. Um, a little bit about me, uh, I've been at Lemoyne for going on two years. I've been in financial aid since 2008 at uh, various institutions, public, private, nonprofit, for profit, uh, all of the above. Uh, before Lemoyne, I was at SU for a long time, and um, and so here I am. Um, my brief, uh, small, and uh, a little bit of a commercial, the, um, the application for Lemoyne College is free. So if you were looking for an easy application through the Common App, that's where you could go. Um, 
I'm also a member of NASFA, which is the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. It's a collection of financial aid folks throughout the country. We do uh, policy advocacy in DC a few times a year. We do some state advocacy and just make sure that uh, funding um, concerns are brought to the people who make decisions to help everyone. So today we're gonna to talk about what it is that you need to know about financial aid. So let's strap in, right? Topics that we will uh, discuss. Number one, what is financial aid? What does that actually consist of? We heard free money, excellent choice of words. That's what I call it a lot of the times. Not all of the times, but a lot of it. Next up is the cost of attendance. Also, we're gonna cover the expected family contribution or the EFC. We're gonna talk about financial need. Uh, could I just grab a quick poll uh, of the folks in the audience? If you need free money, raise your hand. If you need free money for college, raise your other hand. <laughs> Wonderful, okay. So we're gonna talk about how financial aid folks really uh, uh, decipher financial need. We're gonna talk about some categories, types, sources of financial aid. Uh, we're gonna talk about the FAFSA, or the free application for federal student aid. And then last but not least, we're gonna talk about special circumstances. Um, just a run of the mill thing that happens to a lot of folks. Um, a lot of times life is hard to put down on a piece of paper, particularly when it pertains to your family's finances. And that really is where we talk about special circumstances. So let's get a movement. What is financial aid? Financial aid is any dollar provided to a student or their family to help pay for college expenses. Any dollar, whether that's a scholarship dollar, a loan dollar, a dollar straight from your work, any dollar is considered financial aid. Next up, the cost of attendance. The cost of, of attendance is what a college will show you as their quote unquote sticker price, right? Every college has a sticker price and that includes everything from shoelaces to shampoo with tuition and books in between literally everything, what it should cost on average to attend that school. So that includes tuition and fees, room and meals, your books and supplies, transportation to and from campus, well, holidays in between the semesters or the trimesters, uh, depending on the calendar, as well as your personal expenses. Again, sh sh shoelaces, shampoo, some deodorant, everything, all inclusive in the cost of attendance. Next up, is the EFC. So the EFC on the left there is the measurement of a student's and family's ability to pay post-secondary educational expenses. It breaks up to a student contribution and a parent contribution for students who are lucky enough to have parents. One thing that you will see there, oh, hello, there we are. One thing that you will see there is that it specifically says measurement of a family's ability to pay and not necessarily willingness. That is intentional, okay? Moving forward, what is financial need? So this is the math that financial aid folks perform on a daily basis to figure out who needs what and how much. We take the cost of attendance at our school, we subtract from that the expected family contribution, which is the output of the FAFSA, and that is how we get financial need. Easy math, it gets real complicated, real fast. So here we go into the uh, creative side of financial aid, folks. There are two categories of financial aid. There is need-based aid, because you, you needed it, and we had it, so we gave it to you. And then there is non-need-based aid. More creativity. Here we go. There are four different types of financial aid. First, we have scholarships. We briefly uh, touched on these. A lot of these are based on merit, so your GPA, your SAT, your ACT, your counselor recommendations, all of those components uh, of the Common App or, or whichever application you choose to submit will go into a merit scholarship uh, determination. If you're an, um, an athlete or if you're looking for some sort of special talent-based scholarship, a lot of times those will come correlating with an audition or some sort of, of a video or portfolio, all of those things. Next up, we have grants. These are usually based on need, whereas scholarships are based on your students' characteristics. Grants are money that you needed that the school had that is free money that does not have to be paid, heading out your way. Next up is work study or employment. 
Every school will work with work study a little bit uh, differently. Most schools will offer federal work study to a student if they are eligible and if the school has those funds. Uh, at Lemoyne College, I can tell you how that works. Uh, if you have, say, a $1,000 work study award, it will not produce your bill. But you have to think of it a little bit differently. Think of it as an, imagine, uh, an imaginary bag of money that your student could earn and be paid from should they choose to find a job on or near campus and be able to keep that job on or near campus. They will be paid weekly, either direct deposit or a paper check, minus any applicable payroll taxes, and then it becomes uh, their money, so they could buy pizza, they could buy frozen yogurt, or they could pay tuition, it's an option too. That's federal work study. Last, however not least, loans. Loans are dollars that you do have to pay back oftentimes with some interest. Loans are a part of the federal financial aid package. If you complete a FAFSA, the school is required to show you what it is that your student is eligible for in terms of a loan. So financial aid folks don't really love to offer loans, but we are legally required to tell you your loan eligibility. So where does all of this money come from? We got federal money, we got state money, we got money from the school or the college or the university, private sources as well as employers, which we got a plug from, thank you. That's very helpful. So moving on, the federal government is the largest by far source of financial aid. It's not even close, it's like by far. Aid is provided primarily on the basis of financial need. So by completing the FAFSA, we will determine your eligibility for need-based Pell Grants, um, Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grants, Federal Work Study, Subsidized Loans, Unsubsidized Loans, you name it. The FAFSA is available October 1st of every year. You must complete it every year that you want to be considered for free money. So I'll say that part again because a lot of folks forget, right? The FAFSA is available October 1st of every year. So we're, what, two weeks away, right-ish? Next year, for sophomore year, October 1st, you want to circle that date in the calendar and complete sophomore year FAFSA. And you're going to have a FAFSA anniversary for the next two or four years. There are certain eligibility requirements that must be met in order to receive federal financial aid. Not everyone who completes a FAFSA is eligible. There are citizenship uh, requirements. There's criminal history stuff. You name it, it's all in there. Here is a listing of federal student aid programs. So as I mentioned, the Federal Pell Grant, Iraq Afghanistan Service Grant, um, FSEOG, uh, the TEACH Grant, which is not really a grant, it's a loan, uh, but that's what it's called. It's called TEACH Grant. Federal Work Study, uh, your federal direct student loans, and then federal plus loans. The plus loans are either for graduate study or for parents, and so there's a a menu of the FAFSA programs. Next up, states. Uh, so in the state of New York, there is the, the TAP grant program. There's also the Excelsior Scholarship program and the EAP program. Uh, you, for the federal TAP grant, you do have to live in the state of New York and also, or also graduate from a high school in the state of New York. There is an, um, an, a secondary application for uh, the TAP grant. So at the end of your FAFSA, there's a link to complete your TAP application. There are also um, STEM scholarships from the state, so that's a little bit of your merit uh, dollars. The TAP dollars are usually based on need. Um, you can use the information from the FAFSA if you click right at the end. If not, it's gonna ask you for your family's uh, income information, but it's your state income tax information, not your federal income tax information. And the deadline is gonna vary from one state to, to the other. In the state of New York, there are no deadlines, but the money is often linked. Just a heads up for everybody. Next up, colleges and universities. So um, from local college experience, uh, yes, we do pr provide aid on the basis of merit as well as need. Um, when you're considering aid from a college or a university, you really wanna check the college's website to see if they're gonna ask for the CSS profile. That would be yet another application that may or may not be free to be considered for all applicable dollars. So at Lemoyne, we don't do that. Syracuse University will ask you to complete the CSS profile. 
The aid that you get from a particular college or university may be free money, it might be a grant, it might be a scholarship, or it might be federal work study, or it might be an institutional loan. Um, you do want to use your FAFSA information and or your institutional applications, and every school is going to have their own individual deadline, whether that's an early deadline and you want to complete your financial aid stuff on time, or if you're applying regular, it's going to have a different deadline. It's going to get real specific real fast. So there was a question right here. CSS. Yeah. The CSS profile is uh, a financial aid application hosted by the college board. If you complete a FAFSA and you thought it was invasive, um, clear or weak, because the profile is gonna ask you way more information. The profile, unlike the FAFSA, will ask you for your primary home value, it will ask you for debt against your primary home, it will ask you for your retirement account information, your spouse retirement account information, any trusts that you and your spouse may have, uh, grandparents to the student may have. Uh, it's going to ask you also for student asset information, like retirement accounts, whether it's pre-tax, post-tax. I mean, it gets it gets in there. The FAFSA will never ask you for retirement account information, and will not ask you for property information. Um, C is in Charlie. S is in Sam. S is in Sam. C S S. I don't know what it stands for. It's hosted by the College Board, um, the College Score System. I don't know, I made that up, but it's, um, it is the Charlie Sam Sam profile application. <laughs> All right, are we ready? Okay, we're chugging along here. Private sources, so as mentioned earlier, foundations, uh, businesses, churches, civic and charitable organizations. Um, the civic one is really one that's often overlooked. Um, if you're looking, uh, whether that would be like your Masons, your Elks Club, oftentimes small political action committees have scholarship applications. Um, it's all over the place. Um, so the website hosted here by ESM, I'm sure is an excellent resource because they would have likely read all of these opportunities and it, it at least made sure that they were applicable to your students. Um, each individual source of money will have its own deadline. So hypothetically, if you were applying to the ESM club $5,000 scholarship and the application deadline was December 1st and you found out about it November 29th, apply, right? And then make sure that next year you start the application earlier, right? So that, because the application deadline will probably just roll. Um, you want to begin researching private sources early and if you're past the application deadline, keep that in the back of your pocket for next year. The reason why these are very important is likely the applicant pool is very small, right? So I'll give you an example. There is a National Tall Girl Scholarship for $500. This, uh, if you're watching this live right now, I am not uh, vertically endowed. This is not a, um, a scholarship for me. However, if my daughter was over 6'1 and a college applicant, you bet your butt that she's gonna apply each and every year, right? Now, it's gonna be her and the five million other tall girls in the country, right, who are going to apply. So that's five million to one. If it was the ESM tall girl scholarship, how many tall girls are there um, at ESM? It's not even close to five million, right? It's gotta be maybe 20, I have no idea. Uh, but you get the idea, right? It's one in 20 uh, versus one in five million. So that's why these private sources are really helpful because it's a smaller pool out of those eligible applicants, not all of them will apply. So if it's you know 20 possible and half of them apply, and you're one of those half, right? It's one in ten. So it's much better than one in five million. Employers may have scholarships available to the children of employees. Employers may also have tuition benefits for the employee, like your student. Um, they may also have loan repayment options for your student. That is a benefit that we're getting asked about a lot. That is a benefit that parents are, are looking to use at their employers and students are looking to use at their employers. So ask all of the questions at HR. Make sure that you ask about all of your benefits. <coughs> Moving forward to the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid FAFSA is a registered trademark of the U.S. Federal Department of Education. 
Um, if you're anything like me, anything on a computer that's going to ask you for your name, your date of birth, and your social is going to make you a, uh, a little bit leery. I'm here to tell you the FAFSA needs uh, not only parent biographic information, it will also need student uh, biographic information. Please provide name, date of birth, and social. It will also ask you for student financial information. It will also ask you for parent financial information. What do I mean by financial information? Specifically, I'm talking about income from two years ago, and I'm talking about assets as of the day you complete the application. I'll say it again. Income from two years ago. So that would be the 2020 income taxes. And assets as of the day you complete the application. What kind of assets? Well, your checking account balance, your savings account balance, your child's checking account balance and savings account balance. So here's a pro tip. If you have a $10,000 savings account, but you owe $9,000 to a credit card, consider paying off your credit card and then completing your FAFSA. Just consider it. Colleges use EFC to offer financial aid using the math problem that we talked about five or 10 minutes ago, probably longer at this point. It is available online in English and in Spanish. It is also available uh, by fax and on paper in 27 other languages. Should that be needed? So Korean, Arabic, uh, French, I mean, um, Afrikaans, it's, it's a long list. Um, you should complete the FAFSA October 1st or 2nd of this year. So October 1st of 2022 for 2023 enrollment. You're gonna complete the FAFSA October 2nd of 2023 for 2024 enrollment, right? It's an annual application. So here's an example for 22-23 academic year, which is the academic year that we're in right now. The FAFSA became available 2021 last year. Colleges oftentimes have priority dates for the FAFSA. Try and meet those if at all applicable. You do not have to submit your admission application to send your FAFSA to the school. I'll say that part again. You don't have to have a completed Common App or SUNY App or College App prior to sending your FAFSA to the school. Send your FAFSA and then complete your common app or whichever application mode you're using. There are multiple modalities to complete a FAFSA. You could do it online. You could currently do it on the My Student Aid mobile app even though it's being phased out. You could do it on paper. You could do it over the phone. Or you could use the Financial Aid Administrator's website, which is not the best. Um, if it were me, I wouldn't even pay attention to anything under FAFSA on the web. Here's why. If you do it online, in about three days, the Department of Ed can turn around your, your, your FAFSA. If you do it paper, they tell you at least eight weeks. Okay, so three days, eight weeks, three days, eight weeks, if you get the idea. Um, please do it online, if at all possible. More benefits to doing it online. There are, uh, uh, um, there are some built-in edits to prevent costly errors. Meaning, it will only ask you the questions that you need to answer. It will not provide you an opportunity to make yourself look wealthier than you are. What do I mean by that? It's gonna ask you for your income information. So say that you made $50,000 last year. Congratulations, you made $50,000. But you're a human being, and you're five, zero, 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 zero. You just told FAFSA that you made $500,000 last year. Whoops, there's a big lifestyle difference between those things. Use the website to help it more accurately reflect your reality. The skip logic allows students and or parents to skip unnecessary questions, as in, a, do you own a boat, or those kinds of things. I'm kidding, I'm being facetious because it's late um, at night. It also allows you the opportunity to link uh, to the IRS for, for the ability to import your tax return data. Um, and that's really helpful down the line because oftentimes we have to verify the information on your FAFSA. And if you go to the IRS specifically, uh, we will not be, uh, be asked to do that. We being the financial aid office. More benefits of doing it online. We're gonna be able to process it in three days instead of eight weeks. You can get some help uh, buttons right in there. It also allows you the ability to check the application status and it allows you to renew your FAFSA online if you start online. If
if you start on paper, you're going to be living on paper, and it's not going to allow you to renew with some ease. So here's what it looks like. Uh, the URL is there on the bottom. Uh, if you take away nothing else, studentaid.gov. So this is my phone slide, so if you wanted to grab a picture with your phone, now is your chance. I'll get out of the way if you want. So my ugly part's not in here. All right, one, two, awesome. So that's what it looks like. Uh, you notice at the top left it says Federal Student Aid. To the very, very top left it has the American flag and it also says an official website of the U.S. Uh, government. It has some help um, information. It has two primary languages in the top right, English and Spanish. All of these wonderful things. Once you go to log in, it's going to ask you, are you the student or are you the parent? Here is what it would look like on the mobile app. Um, the mobile app can be done by both student and parent, and you can use your own phones if you really wanted to. It also allows you to check the status of it online. It allows you to create a save key. It's protected in the same way as FAFSA on the web. Again, though, it's being phased out, so really just studentaid.gov. More pictures. Oh, and, and there's an ESC in here, I think. It's the same agreement of terms that everyone loves to read. And right here at the end, it'll say, congratulations, your EFC is $5,253. And it will give you a link to complete your TAP application. Um, the IRS data retrieval tool. So when you're in your FAFSA, it will offer you the opportunity to link to the IRS to pull your IRS information straight from the IRS and put it onto your FAFSA. You don't have to use this. Um, however, you really should consider using it. Again, it can save you work down the line about returning or sending to the financial aid office a copy of your taxes and your students' taxes um, and all these things. It will ask you again to authenticate who you are, so it's gonna ask you for your name again, it's gonna ask you for your address again and your social, all of these things, so you may have to input it twice as part of completing the FAFSA. No, it's not trying to steal your information. You literally have to work with two separate government agencies in order to complete the FAFSA in this way, which is why it's asking you twice. If they are able to find your tax record, it will move all of the pertinent tax information over to your FAFSA, eliminating at least eight questions, which is a win. And then later on, it will produce any potential documentation that we need. Who is not able to use the IRS data retrieval tool? Um, if you did not file a tax return, you can't use the IRS data retrieval tool. If the parents were married January 2021 or later, it's not possible for you. If you have an SSN that begins with three sixes, you can't use it. If you filed income taxes abroad, IRS isn't gonna have your information. If you are married and filed head of household, or if you are married and filed separately, IRS data won't be able to flow over. If neither parent has a valid SSN, you can't go to the IRS. And if your social is all zeros, congratulations, you are not eligible. If none of these things apply to you, please, please consider using the IRS data retrieval tool. Last, however not least, is how are you going to sign your FAFSA? And that is with the use of an FSA ID, that's a Federal Student Aid Identification Number. Um, there should only be one FSA ID per person. So what does that mean? That means one FSA ID for one parent, one FSA ID for the other parent, should another parent want to also sign the FAFSA, but then the student is gonna need their own FSA ID. So again, one FSA ID for a parent, and then another one for the student. And you're gonna want to write these down or keep these somewhere because when you complete sophomore year FAFSA, you're gonna need the same FSA ID to electronically sign your FAFSA. So this is what the FAFSA looks like on paper. Hopefully that will be the only view that you guys ever see because you're gonna do it online, right? Yay. All right, what kind of student information is gonna be uh, required? We are gonna need student SSN citizenship status if the student is married or not married, as well as the highest education level completed by either parent. Is parent information going to be required? Well, the FAFSA asks questions to determine the dependency status for 
FAFSA purposes, not IRS purposes. It's a set of 13 questions, if, and they are all yes or no. If the answer is no to all of the questions, we are gonna need the parent information. If the answer is yes to any of the questions, we will not be asking for parent information. These questions are something like, are you married, student? Uh, do you provide support for a, a child? Um, are you active duty? Are you a veteran? Uh, have you sued your parents to be a, a your own person? All of these things. Are you a ward of the court? If the answer is no, we're going to need parent information. What kind of parent information? We're going to need taxes paid, income earned, assets as of the day the FAFSA is completed, if the parent is a dislocated worker, if the parent is uh, receiving means tested uh, federal benefits for either of the previous two years, as well as any untaxed income, uh, kind of like your unemployment benefits. Information about student and or their spouse, we're going to need their tax information, income tax in particular, income earned, uh, the student's uh, dislocated uh, worker status, any assets that the student has, any untaxed income, as well as any uh, receipt of means tested federal benefits in the previous two years. Also, we're going to ask for the, the college, right? So if you're going to go to OCC, you have to put OCC on your FAFSA. So you're going to go to Le Moyne, you have to put Le Moyne on the FAFSA. It allows you to put up to 10 schools on the FAFSA. If your student is, is considering more than 10 schools, um, I'd have a conversation with your student, try and whittle it down. If you can't, submit with your top 10 and then go back and then add your next three or five or however many and then submit it again. Um, the school can't see the other schools on the list, so as long as you are adding schools, that is totally there or, or, or uh, 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 possible. We also ask that you put your housing plans if you're gonna stay on campus or if you're gonna be a commuter. And lastly, if you're gonna pay anyone to complete your FAFSA, which you really shouldn't, because the first F in FAFSA is free, we are gonna need that information. Uh, both student and at least one parent must sign, and again, that would be with the FSA ID that we uh, discussed. Frequent FAFSA errors, the SSNs are often mixed up between student and parent. Uh, believe it or not, it does happen. The, the uh, parent marital status is often um, an error. Step parents must be included. Um, untaxed income, um, the one that irks me the most, uh, US income taxes paid. If you paid income taxes, please make sure that you get credit for each and every dollar that you paid. Household size is often iffy. Um, out of the household, how many are attempting undergraduate study? as well as real estate and investment net worth. The error there is a lot of times folks will include their primary home, which you should not. They will include their 401k or 403b, which you should not. Um, so just make sure that you're reading all of the information and that you click the little question button if you have a question. So you submit your FAFSA and what happens? It goes to the central processing system or CPS. The college receives one copy, the student receives a student aid report and they get an email of their student aid report. It looks a little bit like this. It will have the EFC up top. It's very helpful. The, if you mailed it in, the, the department will mail you a copy of your student aid report and the school receives an ICER, an institutional student information record. And yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. Um, if you made an error, if you accidentally put down that you made half a million dollars in 2020, but it was really $50,000, you can log back in and make a correction if you're doing it online. If it's on paper, you got to call the financial aid office of your student's preferred school. The financial aid office can and will make corrections. They will likely just ask you for some uh, substantiated documentation, which could be uh, your taxes or a W-2 or something like that. Last but not least, special circumstances. There are conditions that exist that will not show up on the FAFSA. Again, the FAFSA is asking for income information of two years ago. A lot has happened in two years. So what can you do when your real life will not fit on a piece of paper? The first step is to call the financial aid office. Tell them your circumstances and they will tell you what it is that you need to send in to make your reality more accurately reflected on your FAFSA. 
That may include sending a written explanation and documentation to the financial aid office. It's up to the college to make any sort of change or determination, and the decisions are final and cannot be appealed to the federal U uh, U.S. Department of, of Education. What are some of these special circumstances? So if there's job loss, if there's a divorce, if, God forbid, somebody passes away, if there's secondary school tuition because of special needs, um, if the student is unable to obtain parental information for whatever reason, if there are unusual or uncovered medical expenses that are not reflected on your FAFSA, we want to know about those. If there's some sort of de um, like dependent care expense in your household, that can help you create additional eligibility. However, the FAFSA will not ask you for this information. You have to call the financial aid office. And that is my slide deck. You guys are all still here. Wonderful, okay. <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions? Acronym or not acronym related, that's fine. Really? Okay. I call once. Oh, there's one in the back. So, so not a question with clarification. Yes. CSS, College Scholarship Service. College Scholarship Survey. Boom. Service. 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 Oh, excuse me. I, I stand corrected. Thank you, sir. Yes. So if you're divorced, which parent shows up on the FAFSA? If that's what your question is, yes? Okay, on the FAFSA, it's gonna be whichever parent provides 50% or more of the student's support. If it's a 50-50 split, then you can flip-flop each year or figure it out however amongst your family unit. Um, on the college scholarship service application that we just all learned about, there will be an additional application for the non-custodial parent, which is similarly invasive. So you're talking assets, income, taxes paid, all sorts of stuff. If the non-custodial parent is incarcerated, unwilling to participate, all of these wonderful things, you have to call the, the particular school's financial aid office to request an NCP profile waiver. That's non-custodial parent profile waiver. Um, if you happen to be in that specific scenario, but yes. Can we put that non-custodial? Non-custodial parent profile is gonna be required for separated uh, biological parents, either divorced or otherwise. And then if that other person is unwilling or unable to participate, you'd have to call the school for a NCP profile waiver. So non-custodial parent profile waiver. And that may or may not be granted. It, it, it goes on a case by case. So yet another application. I know, lots of fun. Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> Keep them coming. Yeah, let's go. What, what if your student doesn't know what college they want to apply to at this point? Do they okay. Fill it out or? So if you don't know what schools you want to apply to, right? Uh, right now. So right now, today, FAFSA is not possible for 23 to 24. But if you get to October 1st, and none of the, the senior meetings yield at least one potential school, um, I would choose one that's, that's somewhat local. I work at Lemoyne, you can choose uh, Lemoyne, and you can send us uh, your FAFSA. We won't read it if you're not going to, uh, to apply, but at least uh, you can walk all the way through. If that changes later, right? Say that October 2nd, you put down OCC, but then by November 1st, you have a list of five other places. You can log back in, add your five other schools, submit it, and now they all have a copy of the FAFSA. Does that make sense? Wonderful. Uh, yes, ma'am. So the question is, um, the student's biological parents have separated, the student's custodial parent is remarried, whose income information shows up on the FAFSA? That would be anyone who resides at the household, regardless of marital status. So you could be uh, unmarried living together, you could be remarried, you could be separated, but yet living together to the step-parent. 
Anyone who resides at the household, their income information is required. Another follow-up. I love it. Alumni scholarship? Yes. So the question is, if the parents went to Lemoyne and then the student goes to Lemoyne, is there an alumni scholarship? I promise I didn't plant this person, okay? <laughs> I, I, I swear. I promise. Um, yes, there is an alumni scholarship. Um, it doesn't have to be the parent. It could be a cousin. It could be whoever. Um, it just has to be a person that alumni affairs can um, certify as, yep, no, that person went here. And then, you know, if they were your neighbor that, you know, babysat 20 years ago or whatever. It could also work, uh, but anyway. I got other ones. Yeah, right here in the middle. So you said anyone who resides in the household, financial information goes on. So if, if the person were filling out the form for has a sibling who may need money, and the sibling also, is not Yeah, sibling is not, is not included. It's the yeah. parent's step parent. And the student may have the money, but if it wasn't required to file. Yeah, the money's still reported, regardless of filing status. So the question, excellent question. If your student worked but did not earn enough to be required to file a federal or state tax return, because you've got to remember about ten, uh, is that income asked about? Yes, it is asked about, and then you have to report it. And, and that's whether it's like like uh, uh, ten, uh, either W two or or like investment earnings if you're on an app or something, or if you're doing crypto or whatever, if you get some sort of, oh, uh, a 1099 or anything like that, all of that stuff's gotta go on there. Hold on, yeah, in the middle here. How about grandparents? Yeah, grandparents are 100% excluded. That also counts for 529s. Up top. Uh, then I to say, if I'm an So if you have a 529 and you are the parent, yes, it will ask you about 529. If you're the grandparent but, and the grandparent does not live in your house, the grandparent income asset is not asked about until two years later when the student is asked about any sort of gift. And that's when it kind of gets reported. A little nuance there. Who's next? I saw some more over here. Oh, excellent. Look at that, I'm betting a thousand. Anybody else? Anybody over here? A bunch of quiet folks over here, okay. All right, I think I'm done here. Oh, here we go. <laughs> So if the student's grandparent resides in the house, is the grandparent's income a part of the FAFSA? No. If the student's grandparent resides in the house and you're completing a CSS profile, yes. So it will be grandparent income and grandparent asset. It will ask you about everybody. Um, so yeah. Anybody else? Asset information? No? I'm sorry? The custodial parent? Yeah, it's gonna ask you about untaxed income as well as your taxable income. So uh, if you if you could uh, picture it, your tax form if you're getting um, SSI or SSDI, uh, there's in the middle and there's a column on the right. So the middle one is the untaxed and the one on the right is the taxable. Both of those gotta get reported, yes. Hold on. 2223 was on 2020 income. 2324 would be on 2021 income. So it's a lot of numbers and, and I struggle, okay? So let's like, just explain this out loud. The tax form that everybody filed by this most recent April 15th of 2022 is your 2021 income, right? It was income that you earned last year. 
That is the income that is going to be used to calculate financial aid eligibility for the school year that begins in 2023-2024. Okay, so for your students, because you guys are all senior parents, right? Yes, so your student who's going to be a freshman next year, the income that you earned last year is what's going to be used for next year's financial aid eligibility. The income that you earned today is what's going to be used for sophomore year. It's a lot. I screw it up all the time, obviously. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, in the middle. You, some of the schools are not using the SAP as part of the application process at this point. That's correct. Uh, at Le Moyne, it's optional. Now, when it's optional, but when it goes to the scholarships, are they still requiring SAP scores to determine the scholarship eligibility? Uh, not at Le Moyne. I don't know about other places. I think these folks could probably answer that a little bit better. Um, okay. Most places um, have a process if they've become test optional or they've waived it all together um, by which you can become eligible for merit money without that SAT or ACT. Like everything we talked about tonight though, we say things like most because there will be some circumstances at some institutions where SAT will still be a requirement as a part of that too. Um, you know, it's hard to give a universal answer because each institution does that differently. So then would you recommend contacting the school if your students are interested in directly to find out if that's the case? I think so. And, and folks, the, the websites are pretty decent, right, at, at giving you that information. So it's pretty accessible in that way. Um, but yeah, certainly calling and, and going that route is the safe bet that will make you feel more comfortable. Um, speaking of which, I, I'm actually, before Cheryl goes to wrap things up too, and, and there may be other questions, but I, I get nervous when we have senior meetings, and I always say to students is, the last thing I want you to do is walk out of the senior meeting with more anxiety. I want you to have information so you walk out feeling better. And I sit here listening to us five, <laughs> and Maximo, and my anxiety's going up. And so I, I feel the same way um, for you. And so, one of the things that I wanted to pull up is our website, just to show, I had talked about the checklist earlier. So I wanted to show you on our website what our checklists, checklists entail, because it covers so much of what we are talking about tonight, and I think in a pretty succinct way, that you will find useful. So the senior meeting packet is what we will review with your student, but it is on our website and you all have access to it. It has dates on here with hyperlinks that are useful to get you to the places that you need. The next page has information about SAT, ACT. Links to score that we talked about tonight. We have a senior financial aid checklist. It walks you through step by step. We have it color coded. What's the student's responsibility? What's the student and parent responsibility? It tells you what year's taxes you need to get together. It tells you the FAFSA website you need to go to and it's linked. At the end in bold, you heard it said earlier and you probably aren't going to remember it. But when you finish your FAFSA, it's going to pop up and say, hey, do you want to do your New York State tap? We have that in bold on here as well. You get to the end, and now what are we supposed to think about? We heard about the CSS profile. In particular, that is for those schools that tend to be on the very expensive side of things, because they give a lot of their own money that they want to know every hidden detail of your financial situation before they give that money to you. We have the CSS profile list of schools that require it linked within this as well. I hope that helps to kind of all these pieces of information that we're giving comes together and then you know you have a checklist and you have a place that you go to. I hope that brings some level of anxiety down um, because it is so hard to take all this information and really synthesize it.
Thank you, Max Mo, and thank you to the counseling team. As you can see, our counselors are very seasoned at what they're doing, and the checklist and all of the information that's pushed out through our social media, through our newsletters and on our website, um, all really comes from the expertise of our school counselors. So please, if you have additional questions that you can't find the answers to, do not hesitate to contact your student's counselor or any one of the counselors in our counseling department. Just a couple of important dates to remember. The Eastside College Fair is coming up on October 3rd. This year it is at Jamesville DeWitt High School. Um, we also have an opportunity for financial aid help. Um, those meetings are going to occur in Zoom uh, rooms. Um, you can register for those through our counseling department. You can make an appointment. Um, there are also financial aid um, events uh, through, through the SUNY system um, on uh, September 27th, December 6th, and um, December 20th. Um, the links are actually in red. They're linked to the actual information that you would need to register for those. Um, we also um, have a link to the SUNY events and SUNY financial aid um, nights. Um, again, I want to thank Maximo Flint Morgan and our school counseling team for all of their expertise tonight. I hope that you found this information helpful. I would like to echo what Mr. White said. It's a lot of information. It's a lot. But um, I'm confident that through the process of meeting, um, of the senior meetings with um, your student school counselors, many questions will be answered. And again, if you should have any additional questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. And we wish all of your seniors a terrific school year and um, looking forward to hearing where they're going to attend next year. So thank you.